Welcome to English Country Life, my name's Fiona. A few weeks ago, we produced a video looking at dealing with short-term power cuts. When we say short-term, that means up to 24 hours in time. But a lot of you gave us fantastic feedback and you were telling us you were having to deal with power cuts significantly longer in length, up to weeks in time. So we thought we'd produce some videos looking at how you can cope with those scenarios. And in this episode, we're gonna look at various options for lighting. Hello, my name's Hugh. Today we're going to talk about the types of lighting that is suitable for use in a protracted power cut. We're going to look at five different types of lighting. We're going to describe what's good and bad about each type, but we're also going to try and show you the relative amounts of light that you can get from different types of light. Well, hello, welcome to the workshop. This may seem an odd place, also may seem a mess, and I'll apologise for the mess. It is a working build and I do need to tidy it up. But it might seem an odd place to test lights, but I want to show you lights based on three criteria. First one is, does it give enough light to move around safely without bumping into lots of objects? Because that's important in your home. The second criteria I want to look at a light on is, does it give enough light to do a task, to read a book perhaps, or to chop some vegetables in the kitchen. Those kind of, you want some bright light in one particular area to do a job. Then the third thing I want to look at is, does it give a nice wide area light? So would it be suitable to sit around with family, with friends, to have a conversation, to have a drink, maybe play a game, you know, just to give a general light that a number of people could enjoy. Now, actually, it's going to be quite tricky to film this because the camera keeps trying to compensate for bad lighting. So, so you're aware, what I've got on at the moment is a couple of strip lights up there, and there is, off to my right, the remains of the sort of evening light. It's going to get dark fairly shortly. So I'm going to lock the camera in to these settings so it's set to this level of light. And I'm not going to let it try and compensate for low light. So some of what you see later might be very bright, some of it might be very dark, and that's going to accurately portray the difference in the different forms of lighting. Some lights I will hang on a hook that I put conveniently here, some will sit on the table according to their nature, but they're all going to be illuminating this area and the wider areas around us. So I don't know what we're going to find, how it's going to film. Let's find out together. In this first section, we're going to talk about the most common type of lighting that most people have in the house for emergencies, and that's candles. They're cheap, they're easy to store, but they don't give a lot of light and they can be a fire hazard. So let's start with something we all understand. One candle. I'm filming at exactly the same exposure as I was before, and I'm guessing you can see the candle, but not much else when I set the shot up. Could I read by this? I could, but I'd get eye strain pretty quick. Whilst it isn't obvious to you, I'm sure, because you're looking at it on a fixed exposure, my eyes are adjusting. And yes, you know what? For a good area, not all the workshop, but for a good area, I could walk around without bumping into things. I don't think if there were people sat around me, I could see their face as well. We certainly couldn't play a game that involved seeing each other, but we could have a conversation if we had a few of these. The solution when one candle is not enough, multiple candles. And of course that happened. People had pairs of candlesticks, multi-branch candlesticks, candelabra, in the days when they wanted more light and one candle wasn't enough. And with this number of candles, I can make out the book, I can see the illustrations, I can comfortably read in this kind of light. I could also make out faces around me, comfortably hold a conversation. 
I wouldn't, I think, want to do like fast knife work if I was prepping food in the kitchen. It's not that bright. But your eyes do adjust and I can make out both ends of the barn sitting here with this amount of light. So certainly enough, although think about it, you would get through some candles maintaining this amount of light. But does it work? Yes, it does. While we're on the subject of candles, let's briefly touch on tea lights. This is one tea light in front of me. And is it useful as a source of illumination? Well, yes and no. I mean, yeah, it would actually stop me bumping into things as my eyes have adjusted. I can see enough, it provides enough illumination that I wouldn't bark my shins on the furniture. But that's about it. I couldn't read, I certainly wouldn't be able to make out faces sat across the room for me. So it has its place but it's limited. The next type of light we're going to be talking about are oil lamps, but you may know them better as kerosene or paraffin lamps. Now they do give much, much better light than candles do, so they are a step up, but they smell. They really, really do smell and they can be difficult to light. So what's next on the evolution of lighting? Well, the oil lamp. This is a small wick based oil lamp and there's a lot of variety out there and there's some really really pretty ones we have a number in the house we don't use them much but we think they suit our old cottage they look lovely and as you can see they throw out a decent amount of light far better than a candle i could read this book quite comfortably with an oil light. And oil lights have been around for ages. The Romans had oil lights. And oil used to be such a valuable commodity. Long before we were mining oil from underground, the reason that we had a whaling fleet, yeah, I understand completely how appalling that was, but whale oil was vital for lamps. That's why they did what they did. It was in a way of being able to see in the dark. And oil lamps are remarkably effective. Certainly, I can read. Certainly, I can see quite comfortably. This is a small portable one with a handle, so I could carry it around. I could light my way to bed. And it provides enough light, probably, to see the faces of the people around me. Again, you know, whilst I can read something close, I could do cooking. I wouldn't want to be moving around in a kitchen relying on just one oil light because that would be sort of minimally safe, to say the least. You know, you could, at a push, use it to sort of boil a kettle or do a little bit of chopping in front of it, but it wouldn't provide a good area light. But certainly, vast improvement over a single candle. This is a pressure lantern. It's another form of paraffin or oil lamp, but what happens is you pump up the paraffin in the base, you actually do create pressure, like using a garden sprayer. You have to pre-warm the burning area, you usually burn a little bit of methylated spirit in there, or denatured alcohol, just to warm everything up. And what that warming up does is it allows the paraffin to turn to a vapour, which is then burned through a mantle and creates a much brighter light than a wick based light. These were common on farms right up to the Second World War and beyond when they didn't have mains electricity. They were the main form of light for a long time. They take a little bit of getting used to. You do have to learn how to light them, but paraffin generally is a lot safer than petrol. So they are quite a viable light. People live by these lights for a very long time. The next light we're going to talk about is the petrol or the Coleman lantern. These are incredibly good at throwing out lots of light, but petrol is highly flammable, so being safety conscious is a must with these lamps. So we've moved on again. We've done candles, we've done paraffin slash oil lamps. This is a petrol lantern. It's a pressurised lantern, very similar in design to the pressurised paraffin lantern we looked at before but it runs on petrol. And because petrol is much more volatile, it's honestly less of a faff to light. Obviously the downside is petrol is much more volatile, so you have to be very careful with it. It's a mantle lantern again, so it's got twin mantles, which obviously gives us twice as much light. They're known as Coleman lanterns because Coleman are pretty much the dominant make of petrol lanterns. There are others, but Coleman are the most well-known. It gives off a considerable 
amount of light. I can see easily right across the workshop. I could see, even if this was at one end, I'd easily see to the other end. I could easily see a face where you are, where the camera is. I could read, I could work, I could work in a kitchen with just one of these. They do give off a really quite significant amount of light. The next format of lantern are propane lanterns, or we call them gas lanterns here in the UK. And you might be familiar with them if you camp in very small formats, but you can get them in much, much bigger sizes. Now, there's not a great deal that's a downside with these particular lanterns, other than they can be quite unsightly. We've arrived at gas lighting. Of course, mains gas lighting was very common for a very long time prior to the rollout of electricity. Um, this is a small camping gas light. So they're still around. I remember as a kid, we used to go caravanning. Um, we didn't go to hotels or anything smart like that, but my folks had a small caravan and that had gas lights in it. This was long before battery technology was up to that, before there were mains hookups on, on campsites. But you know what? They were great. You know, there was a gas cylinder outside the caravan. There were two little lights inside that worked on a mantle, the same as this. And my dad would light them at night and he'd curse when the mantle got broke. But honestly, it really was quite an adventure and quite good. And they give, I think you can see, a useful amount of light. I could read, I could comfortably sit with friends, have a conversation, you know, see their faces. I could work in a kitchen. It's a cracking little light with a very small footprint. It will freestand or it will hang. Now we're cooking with gas. This is a bullfinch lantern, also known as a sight light, made by another brand, but virtually identical. You can probably see it's another gas mantle light, but it has a gas hose leading from it. And that leads outdoors to a big propane cylinder. And you do have to keep the propane cylinders outdoors for safety reasons. But these were used as sight lights by workmen in buildings where there was no mains power available right up to the rechargeable led lights became available because you can move these anywhere they run for an incredibly long period of time on a big propane cylinder they give a really useful amount of light and if you've got propane cylinders anyway because you use them for cooking etc what a great thing to have as a backup because you can pick these up for next to nothing now because the rechargeable work lights have replaced them The last option we're going to look at are LED lights. These are great for carrying on your normal day-to-day -day life. They throw out a lot of light and come in lots of different formats. The only problem is they do need a power source. So you either need to have a lot of batteries available to you or a means of recharging them in the event of a power cut. We've moved into the modern age and we're looking now at battery lanterns. This, I think, is an absolute bargain. We bought these years ago from B&Q they were charging $1.99 for them. There are probably brighter ones out there now. We're only going to talk about LED for lighting because why would you buy anything else now? But these, you know, two quid each use four AA commonly available batteries and they give a good workable light. I can read by it. I could certainly walk around the house safely with it because it's LED. It's totally safe as a night light for the kids or to leave one on top of the toilet so that you can find where you're going in the bathroom. You know, I could see faces around me. It's not the brightest thing in the world. I'd probably hang it up. I'd be able to see a little bit better, but it's too quid, you know? And if you had a way of recharging those batteries as well, what an absolute bargain for backup lighting. This light, I love. If you're only going to get one light for power cuts and emergencies, get something like this. It's a directional small AA work light. It's also got a built-in torch. You can angle it, so you can have it as a bedside reading light. You can have it on your coffee table pointing to your Dick Francis novel. It's got two levels of lights. So you can have that perfectly capable of reading with. Although if you wanted to light the room up, you'd use the brighter setting. And it's also got a torch in the end. And what a cracking little bit of kit and almost no money. So 
The fact that it's got a stand, the fact that it's got different light levels, the fact that you can use it as a torch or as a lantern, brilliant things and cheap as chips. I will link to a list of suitable devices in the description down below. So if this is the sort of thing you're looking for, you can find where to get it in our Amazon storefront. We're on to the bigger camping lanterns now. So this is another LED lantern, it runs on batteries, it runs on D cell batteries. Produces a really useful amount of light. You could certainly use it to light a living room, for a kitchen, to read by, to move around with, to socialize and play a game. It would be fine for all of that. Runs on D cell batteries. And honestly, I get why, because it gobbles up the power to produce this amount of light and D cells hold more power than sort of double A's do, etc. But the downside of that is I don't keep many D cell batteries, but we have got a little wrinkle about that. You can get a sleeve that turns a double A into a D cell. It will fit into a D cell lantern like that. Won't run as long, but we've invested in a lot of rechargeable double A's. So actually I can make this lantern work on rechargeable batteries that I have plenty of, which I find quite handy. I'm sat here with one of our rechargeable LED work lights and it is painfully bright. It's like I'm being interrogated with a searchlight looking at me. They are useful in an emergency because they're always charged here because I use them all the time. But honestly, they're more useful for something like if you've got to fix an engine, if you've got to sort of work on something and you need really bright light, then they're fantastic. As an area light, as a comfortable light for sitting in, they're not ideal. You can make them work and the best thing to do is point them up at the ceiling and bounce the light around. And if it's all you've got, you certainly work with it. But honestly, if I was going to choose something to have as an area light, as a replacement room light, it probably wouldn't be one of these. I hope that helped. That's five different types of light. We've tried to talk about the pros and cons of each, and we've tried to show you what kind of lighting you can expect to get from each type. Now, I don't think there's one perfect kind of lighting. I think, given that we are looking towards emergencies here, having one that can run on the types of fuel that you've got anyway, makes a lot of sense. If you cook as we do using propane cylinders, well, having a light that can connect to a spare propane cylinder, really, really useful got an old cottage and you want to have a few decorative oil lamps around, having a can of paraffin, kerosene, so that you can fill those lamps and actually use them, well that makes a lot of sense. I think we should all have a few LED lights because they're just useful in day-to-day -day living. Now one thing I didn't talk about in there, but if you have those kind of little rechargeable outdoor lights that people use to mark paths and illuminate their gardens, don't forget that most of those have got a switch on them and you can bring them in, turn them on in the house at night, take them out during the day and have them recharged by sunlight. And isn't that handy? They're not the brightest thing in the world, but if you've got them anyway, why not use them? If you've enjoyed today's content, can you spare us five seconds? Give us a thumbs up down below. We do plan to do more in this series. We're thinking of talking about cooking and heating and other topics that you might have to cope with in a natural emergency or long-term power outage. If you'd like to see those, let us know in the comments what particularly interests you and we'll try and focus the videos on that. And if you want to see those videos and everything else we make, just tap on subscribe, the bell next to it, and you'll hear every time we upload a new video. But for now, thanks for watching. Come back and see us soon. Take care.